Okay, looks like we have everyone here. Um, it looks also looks like we have uh, two attorneys um, that wish to present an argument for the app appellees in this case. Um, when it gets to your turn, I am going to ask uh, how you all wish to divide your time. So if you haven't figured that out amongst yourselves, please please do so now. Um, but with that, uh, Ms. Norse. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court, my name is Kristen Norse, and together with Stuart Markman of Kynes, Markman, and Fellman, we represent William Lively. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. You've got it. This is an appeal of a defense judgment in a medical malpractice case, and reversal is required because the trial court's ruling that it lacked authority to grant the new trial based on the manifest weight of the evidence after it had found the jury had accepted testimony, expert testimony that was not credible was based on an error of law. The appeal is unusual in that both all the parties agree that the reason the trial court gave for denying the motion for new trial was wrong as a matter of law. The trial court found that the testimony of the defense's expert on negligence and causation, Dr. Albrink, was not credible and that his opinion was contrary to the physical evidence, but that the jury had accepted the testimony. Despite that, the trial court ruled that it lacked any authority to grant a new trial. It believed that the Florida's then adherence to the Fry standard of expert testimony prohibited it from granting a new trial, but the Daubert standard would. All parties agree that the trial court's stated reason was contrary to the law. The trial court had the authority to grant a new trial based on the manifest way of the evidence, regardless of whether Fry or Daubert was law. And the controlling case law, including the Florida Supreme Court's opinion in Van versus Schmidt holds that when as here, the trial court's ruling on a new trial motion is based even in part on an erroneous view of the law, then the reversal is required. In fact, the Florida Supreme Court has consistently held that a trial court is not only authorized to grant a new trial if it, if it concludes the jury's verdict is against the manifest way of the evidence, but it could, should quote, always do so when it concludes the jury was deceived as to the force and credibility of the evidence. Ms. You know, Norris, Ms. Oh, excuse me. We're here on, on de novo review, correct? On the legal issue, correct. Whether his okay. error was whether a, whether yeah. error was whether the verdict here was against the manifest way to the evidence. And so in looking at that, we have to look at the complete record. We have to look at the whole testimony, not just discrete portions of the testimony, right? I don't think you have to look at the evidence at all, actually, because the trial court's ruling is, I can't, I don't have the authority to grant this new trial based on Fry. And everybody agrees that's not true. Fry has nothing to do with his but, authority. But isn't that, that's just a red herring. I mean, no one asked for Fry or Daubert, correct? I mean, that wasn't even in the motion for new trial, from what I understand. It wasn't, but that's exactly, I, and I don't know why the trial judge did it, but that's precisely what he says. He says, I find that under Daubert, I would have this authority, but I find that under Fry, I don't. So there's okay. no doubt that regardless of the fact it wasn't argued, this is the legal precedent that he's relying on. Well, if we, well, let's, let me get past that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I understand what your argument is on that, but how can we say here, based upon the evidence before us on a de novo review, that the verdict here was against the manifest way to the evidence, where if Mr. Lively's position was that the doctor breached the standard of care by the improper placement of the trocar during the surgery to remove his appendix. And so if the breach was injury to the nerve, Dr. Portner, which was Mr. Lively's own, um, own expert here, testified that he couldn't, within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, say that the ilioinguinal nerve was injured during that surgery. Am I right? Okay, there's a little bit to unpack there. Okay. okay. Let me start with the standard of review. Because I said it's de novo as to the trial, what I said was the trial court's legal reasoning. But if you believe that his legal reasoning is a red herring and that he actually decided this based on the weight of the evidence and denied it for that reason, then your review is not de novo, it's abuse of discretion. Um, but I, I don't think you can square that with what his findings were because his findings were that it was not credible testimony 
and that it, it, it and the jury had accepted it. So if we're getting into analysis, we only get into the an analysis of the evidence if we find that that's what the trial judge ruled on and that he that the, the legal basis that he gave to has no meaning whatsoever. Um, so I, I think you get into that evidence and then it's, and then it's an abuse of discretion standard. Is his, um, is his findings, the court's findings. Which is, uh, even, which is a lower standard because we have to make difference. We have to find an abuse of discretion. Right, you would have to find an abuse of discretion. So it does really hint on if you, if you think that the Fry versus Daubert that he says at the hearing can be set aside, um, then you, you, know, you have to look at deference to his findings, um, which said that the jury was you know, accepted incredible testimony. Um, and where, I, is the, where is the evidence? And I, and I, and I saw where the, the court said that, but where, where was the evidence that the jury accepted that? Because there, there was other evidence um, before the jury that they could have also accepted that gave reasonable explanation as to possibly what happened here. Okay, so number one, <laughs> the, the judge, there was evidence, there was record evidence that the jury had accepted it. And the, and the, the trial court pointed out that, you know, that, that the defense in fact had touted this expert as their key expert they had gone through, you know, very impressive credentials, and that they had, and then they had used his changed opinion, um, and then touted him as a credible, honest guy. Um, so that supports the trial judge's finding that the jury actually accepted this testimony, uh, and there was definitely record evidence that the, the the doctor had changed his testimony. I do want to come back to Dr. Portnier because this came up at the hearing on the new trial motion. The trial judge said, well, what about the testimony of Dr. Portnier that he couldn't tell or he couldn't give an opinion as to which nerve was injured? And what trial counsel explained, which is backed up by the record, is that when he started to ask Dr. Portnier about the urology uh, aspect of treatment, which was then what was the evidence of which nerves were injured, uh, there was an objection from the defense. He can't talk about that. He's not a urologist. Uh, so at that point, Trial counsel, uh, Lively's counsel said, fair enough, I'll ask the urologist about it. Now in cross-examination, the defense gets up and says, you're not giving an opinion on that. No, I'm not, I can't. And then later, Dr. Weinberg comes, the urologist, and he says, it's this nerve uh, and not the other. And what the trial court also found is that the opinion of Albrink at trial, which was entirely different from his opinion before, couldn't be supported and was actually in conflict with the rest of the physical evidence. And to explain that, so the, the key shift in position by Dr. Albrink is this. In deposition, he says, the ilioinguinal nerve was injured. And it's just, it just happens sometimes. And then he's pressed on that, that he's- Well, he's, he's, he's not just pressed. I mean, it was a, a pretty thorough cross-examination um, from, the, from the transcript that was delved into. And so that was all brought up during the trial, correct? That the jury had. It was brought up during the trial. Uh, and so he, and, and I just- to, And so the jury had the opportunity to weigh that evidence. It did. And the judge said in his ruling that the court, that the jury then accepted that even though it conflicted, it conflicted with the physical underlying evidence. And he said, the only reason I'm not granting a new trial is because I think the Fry standard prohibits it. So Actually, what, what, he, what he said, which is kind of strange, was that he couldn't overrule the expert, which is a really, it struck me as just a, a in this context, a, an especially strange thing to say on top of a kind of a strange ruling about Friar Dahlberg. What are we to make of that, that in a motion for a new trial, a trial judge is considering whether or not he should overrule testimony that was already presented and impeached that the jury considered and that he's trying to divine whether the jury accepted or not. Like how, how do we put that within what we what should have been considered? And that kind of segues, I know that's a long segue, but it segues into what I'd like to hear your thoughts on, which is, did you really get a ruling 
on whether or not the verdict was against the manifest weight of the evidence at all, um, such that your your kind of your best case here, your best your best result would be a limited reversal with a remand just to tell the trial court make a ruling under the appropriate standard. Okay, so I'm gonna hit the overrule issue first, and then the remedy issue. Thank I you. Think it would be. So on the overruling, he says, um, and, and uh, you know, we have the, the two page thing. He's, he calls the parties back. Mm -hmm. uh, he hear, heard all the evidence and the arguments about what the evidence could have shown, didn't show, whatever. You know, in, in trial, the, the defense is this guy's honest and credible and, and they come back and it's like, oh, they, they didn't pay any attention to that. Um, and, the, and the judge says, come back. I'm gonna come back and give you my ruling. So there's a two page ruling. And the judge said, he does say, I cannot over the rule, overrule it, but he says um, that that is in because of the Fry versus Daubert. And you can kind of see where he's maybe trying to analogize that under Daubert, the, the judge is more of a gatekeeper, um, but it really doesn't have anything to do with this. Um, even under any, either of these standards, number one, uh, evidence by an expert that is not actually supported by the underlying uh, evidence is, is of no evidentiary value. And number two, if you find that the jury has been deceived by incredible evidence, then you can grant a new trial as a matter of law. Now, when he comes back and he gives his ruling, he says, I'm basing it on Fry versus Daubert. I'm gonna take the unusual steps so of giving you some specific findings. I don't find, I find that he was not credible. I find that his opinion is not supported by the physical evidence, um, but under the Fry versus Daubert. Um, now he did not say the magic words, right? He he didn't say uh, deceive. Well, but that's that's not the that's not the entirety of the problem here, right? I mean, you, literally, it, his. It, I, I see what you're, how you're trying to frame this, and it's maybe not an unreasonable way to try to frame what it was he did, because we're all struggling to figure out what what it was he did that he is saying, I, I would just reject this expert's testimony. I would, I would have never let it in and therefore the jury would have ruled a different way. Um, but even that, even if we accept that, that's, that, is, that does not do the next step of saying, hey, as Judge Smith pointed out, there's, there's a lot of other, other evidence out there that, that the jury could have considered. And we don't have a ruling there as to what the judge would do with the entirety of the evidence. He seemed like just laser focused on this on this one expert and on this one issue that that he plucked kind of from nowhere, um, without considering or, as I see it, maybe even ruling upon the broader state of the evidence that was presented to the jury. And I think that you, when you look at the judge's ruling. It, it, you're right, he doesn't go as far as saying that he is focused on Albrink's testimony. I, I think it's reasonable to, so what the case law says is once you determine the trial judge made an error of law, uh, and I, I do think that's inescapable here, that you, you can't write off the Fry analysis because he says it's, it's, it hinges on his authority, which it does not. So once the judge has made an error of law, then you look at, can you tell from this record, but for that error, he would have granted the motion? If so, then you remand for a new trial. Uh, and, and I don't think that there's another way to interpret what his findings are other than that, because I think they match up to the deceived by the credibility. Um, but if this court has any concerns about that, then yes, the, then, then the proper now, the proper re remedy is to remand it to the trial court and say, you know, we see your, we see your findings, we see your legal ruling, the legal ruling is wrong apply the proper standard from the from the Van versus Schmidt case, from the, this court's Myers case, and then tell us what you would do, whether you would grant the trial. Okay. Um, I think that we, we pretty covered, covered it all. I mean, the defense's arguments are basically either that the trial court didn't make a legal ruling that it just decided based on the greater way of the evidence. But again, the transcript refutes that he specifically cited Fry and specifically talked about authority. That distinguishes it from these cases where the judge says, well, in my opinion, this, this would, I would have waited this way or that, but never talks about their authority and cites some type of legal authority for their ruling. And then there are other arguments again, are to say, well, if, if he didn't make the legal ruling uh, that, that he did, then you reweigh all this evidence. But the, the Van case is clear that that's really for the trial court to do. That's the trial court's job 
to review that evidence given its superior vantage point and make the determination. And again, the trial court's findings here specifically say how he was troubled, how this, this witness who was their key witness, who was their only wit expert witness on negligence and causation uh, had provided incredible testimony and that that jury had accepted that. I do wanna come back for one minute to explain this evidence on the causation because of one of Judge Smith's questions. And Ms. Norris, just to let you know, you're, you're coming up on in your five minutes. So if you, if you wish to do so, that's fine, but I just wanna let you know where you're at. Okay. I will, I will defer on that. The trial court's ruling that it lacked legal authority is an error of law. And we'd ask this court to reverse and remand uh, to the trial court for further proceedings. Very good. Okay, we'll turn it over to the other side. Um, I guess, um, who, who's going to take the lead here and how much time do you, do you wanna take? If you may please the court, uh, Mr. Azron and I have conferred and um, he has kindly agreed to let me have for fluidity purposes, 15 minutes. And then okay. he will take the remaining five. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, maybe when you're at about 14 minutes, I'll let you know you're at your last minute and then we'll, we can segue over to Mr. Azron. Thank you, your honor. All right, go may ahead. Please May it please the court, Diana Stein on behalf of Dr. Goble Granhage, uh, and uh, uh, the trial court's rulings have to be given an interpretation that they were in accordance with the law. Uh, here, the court uh, made, uh, Judge Lucas described it as strange. Uh, it's an awkward way of saying he's deferring to the jury on a credibility issue. Uh, I think what's important to look at is that Fry is a pure opinion standard. Uh, the court, by the way, had an hour and a half hearing and extensive memorandum of law where Daubert and Fry were just non-issues. They just were not brought up. He clearly was not ruling on Fry. What he was saying was that Fry understands that experts are allowed in, whether they're credible or not, if they pass the test. And so I am not going to sit as a seventh juror and question uh, the, the jury, either accepting his testimony or finding based on another uh, issue. Uh, that's exactly, by the way, what happened in the Nelson case in this, the Florida Supreme Court. That was a death penalty case where the trial court did something very similar. Uh, he was just determining evidence of what death penalty, whether to impose a death penalty and questioned whether one of the experts passed the Fry test. And the Supreme Court said, that's really a discussion on credibility. And since Fry wasn't raised in the trial court, we're treating it as that. And it's just extraneous judicial musings. Uh, and of course, all of the discussion about Daubert after that is clearly extraneous musings uh, about what he would have done had another standard applied when it was never even raised in the trial court has nothing to do with anything. Uh, when we get back down to it, there was a very extensive hearing on the facts and the trial court did raise them some things. For instance, regard to Dr. Portnier, he said, you know, that was devastating. He stated, he agreed in the first five minutes or the first, um, I guess, opening questions of his cross, that it's impossible to tell what nerve was injured. He said, I could see how the jury would have hung on to that. Uh, and, and in fact, when his counsel said, tried to limit his testimony and say, but that he couldn't have said that, you know, he couldn't have made that testimony. The court said, well, did you rehabilitate him? I mean, he pointed out that this all went before the jury. The jury heard it. They were allowed to consider uh, that very uh, questionable causation, and they were allowed to uh, determine this on standard of care. That's the other important thing uh, that the plaintiff pretty much sets aside, is that the jury asked for testimony and deliberations, uh, and, and the court recognized that. And if, if you look to the testimony that was read back to them, that was Dr. Grandhage, and he was testifying about the surgery itself. And he goes through how he carefully uh, opened up the, the incisions. He used a camera to visualize. Uh, he was with his partner. They were looking at the various structures in the body. Uh, they wanted to hear that he did the surgery carefully, that he was able to visualize the structures uh, and that he didn't breach the standard of care. That was, that would have been sufficient for a defense verdict, you know, putting aside whether or not Albrink, Dr. Albrink was credible or not. Uh, so, you know, again, Dr. Albrink's credibility, uh, he, he, he could have just simply not testified, but testified on standard of care and the jury still could have come up with a defense verdict. Uh, which, which Ms. Stein, you're, you're kind of, you're doing a good job of going over, you know, the, what you felt, what you feel like are the facts that would have supported 
the trial court's ruling denying um, the motion for new trial, had it considered it under the rubric of manifest way to the evidence, because you're properly saying, look, look at all this evidence that, that was in the record, except there's just no escaping that, you know, if, if I had to put all the comments the trial judge made here in silos, musings versus dispositive rulings, all the stuff that you're talking about really could go in the musing silo. When you get down to the, to the, where the rubber hits the road, he very clearly says, but for this standard, I would grant, which honestly seems to suggest that maybe he viewed this evidence, um, that, that the verdict was against the manifest way of the evidence, or at a minimum, we just don't know that he went through that analytical process, in which case, wouldn't, wouldn't Ms. Norris be correct that, that there ought to be a limited reversal and remand to, to get you all a ruling on the motion that was decided? Thank you, Your Honor. And, and I, I disagree with that. And that's the, the comment that I made in the beginning as far as what he said, what he would have done had Daubert applied, I submit is purely hypothetical. Maybe he wouldn't have said it had he known that the Daubert standard would have become the law in the next you know, few weeks after that. But if, but if I tell somebody, were it not raining, I would go outside. You cannot, and, and then I, I don't go outside. You, you might can say whether or not I'm right about whether or not it's raining, but you cannot possibly say that there's any question about what my motive is or what, what it is that I'm, what analytical process I am engaging in when I make that statement, right? Uh, well, correct. But again, here, I mean, let's go just the legal aspects of it. Let's say the Daubert standard was the standard. The judge could not have granted a new trial based on Daubert. I mean, we know that he just could not have done it because it's not a standard for a motion for new trial. Right, right. It's, a, it's an admissibility yeah. standard, right? We, we right. I think everyone on this, on this oral argument understands that the, the stated basis for what the trial court did is just incorrect. The question then is, okay, you've got just a, what looks to be an incorrect legal ruling. Can you salvage what he says with what he needed to be ruling upon for purposes of motion for new trial? Well, absolutely. You know, I, I go back to his intent because, again, you know, if he could say anything he wants hypothetically when thinking it's not going to make a difference. But what really what really matters in this ruling is his reason when he said when he talked about Fry in the beginning uh, and, and said, I believe that I cannot overrule the jury. And I submit that is what his ruling was, is that Fry means everything is considered by the jury. Uh, there's a lot more jury questions than under the Daubert standard. Therefore, it came in. It's a credibility issue, and I'm not second guessing the jury. Now, mm -hmm. Daubert, you know, he could have meant that if Daubert had been the standard, there would have been a hearing. You know, we don't know. Uh, and that's why I say Daubert, th that whole discussion is so hypothetical because it wasn't the law. He's saying what he might have done had something been different. You know, maybe he meant that there would have been a Daubert hearing. Uh, but there would be no point to have him go back and determine this, you know, in light of Daubert, because we know that's not a standard for a motion for new trial, uh, for manifest weight of the evidence. Uh, you know, what he didn't say on the record was that the jury was deceived as to the force and effect of the evidence. Uh, what he didn't say on the record was that the jury was somehow uh, uh, misconceiving um, things that are outside the record. He didn't say anything that would justify a motion for new trial. Uh, I mean, in order granting a new trial, you know, and, and plaintiff keeps saying this is, you know, Van versus Schmidt, Van versus Schmidt, as soon as we find an error in the legal ruling, you know, that's just de novo and we go back for a reconsideration of that motion to the court. You know, I disagree with that. You know, first of all, this is not an order granting a new trial where the court has to put their findings in the order and that's just subject to a different type of standard of review. Uh, you know, this is an order denying a new trial where he really didn't have to say anything. Uh, he ended up making these comments that uh, are subject to, you know, plaintiff is trying to make an interpretation of. Uh, but at the end of the day, he was saying, you know, Fry lets everything in. It's a credibility issue. This was all for the jury. And I'm not going to sit as a seventh juror. 
I mean, again, we have to give his comments and interpretation that would conform to the law. And that's a very easy way of doing it, which the Supreme Court, you know, found in the Nelson case, which just happened to involve similar uh, type of musings by the court. You know, so if, if we were to send this back for a this limited reconsideration, you know, I'm not even sure what it would be. You know, the court made his ruling. We know it's not going to be based on Daubert versus Fry. He already said he finds the, the witness not credible, but it's a jury issue. You know, that's proper commentary. And, and well, I, and I don't. But that's the thing. I don't know. I mean, I. You know, this is this is kind of the the difference between what we do here in reviewing these these orders on motions for new trial and what trial judges do. He was the one that was there. I mean, I, he he got to size up all these witnesses that, that you're talking about. We're reading it from a cold record, but he was the one that actually saw it. He, he got to eyeball how the different witnesses affected or did not affect the jury. I don't know how he how he rules when you know when he is properly kind of put it put in, a, in the right framework of, hey, just look at this as, man, you know, was was the verdict against the manifest weight of the evidence? Um, yes or no? I, I, I don't know, because he hasn't told us. Well, th you know, there's another aspect to this. And I think, you know, Judge Smith asked about it, but, but that is, and, you know, we're, we're contending this is pure abuse of discretion. Uh, at, the court is in a position where it can see the entire record. And I think it's clear, you know, you don't have to be at trial to see that the standard of care issues really weren't the subject of the motion for new trial. I mean, this really went back to Dr. Albrink's testimony of, you know, which nerve, uh, if any, were injured. And, and so that's really, you know, the, the fatal problem that plaintiffs would have if this was even going to be remanded is they can never get past that in that the jury, they heard evidence that Dr. Grandhidge met the standard of care. They specifically asked to have that testimony, his testimony on that issue read back to them in deliberations. And the court recognized that in the actual hearing on the post-trial motions that, you know, that's the way the jury uh, decided to go with this case. He said, I might not have gone that way, but that's what the jury did with this case. So at the end of the day, I mean, we, we still have whether Dr. Albridge, Albrink was credible or not on you know, which nerve was injured, uh, th the jury easily could have found in favor of the defense on standard of care. And in fact, the record is very supportive of the fact that they did so. So you know, I'm not sure what any kind of limited reassessment would do in this case when at, at the end of the day, we could all see now uh, that the court, who did not have to give his reasons, um, was didn't properly didn't act as a seventh juror just because he found one witness to not be credible. Um, so I would submit that there's absolutely, you know, there's nothing to be done by sending this back simply because what the court said was strange. Ms. Yeah. Ms. Stein, but, yes, but you, you would agree that it's for the trial court to weigh, right? that the issue of whether or not this the verdict was against the manifest way to the evidence that that's for the trial court to weigh and not our court that's first. it has to be done first that no i i agree with that judge smith um i submit he did he heard the hearing he heard the arguments from both sides he came back and essentially said that he said i might not have gone the same way as the jury uh, but i'm not going to second guess them you know, all of the arguments of the manifest weight of the evidence standard were given to this judge. I mean, nobody argued Fry or Daubert in, in defense of the motion for new trial. So he did weigh the evidence and he said, you know, I find one witness not credible, but I can't second guess the jury on that. So I submit he did. There's no evidence that he didn't. He made these comments that I agree are strange. I think they can easily be interpreted to be just comments on the credibility of the, of the witness in that it's Fry, it all comes into evidence and it's all for the jury. And that's an issue of credibility, which I can't overrule. So I submit it was done. It absolutely was done. There's uh, other than you know the comments, there was nothing in the record to suggest that he was given the wrong standard or focused on the wrong standard. You know, this is, as he said on the record, a 22 year judge 
who has heard these motions before and is well familiar with the standard uh, and that it's not Fry and it's not Daubert. Uh, these were extraneous judicial musings. Uh, one of them had to do with law that wasn't even effect at the time, which has nothing to do with this case. Uh, what he was saying was that this was a jury issue on credibility. He's not second guessing the jury. Uh, so I submit that nothing can be accomplished uh, at all by submitting, sending this back to him and asking him to just reword his ruling. He made his ruling, he heard argument, he heard the motions uh, and it should stand. The court's ruling should stand. Um, at, at this point, unless your honors have additional questions for me, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Azarone. All right. Thank you, your honors. Thank you, Mr. Azarone. Thank you, may it please the court. Um, Obviously, we, my client incorporates all of Ms. Stein's arguments. There, there are just two other things I wanted to bring up that were contained in my answer brief. And it, it kind mm -hmm. of hits on both the comments of Judge Lucas and Judge Smith. The first thing is we're looking at one minute issue from one witness on causation. The record is clear that there were no objections to Dr. Albrecht's testimony when he was testifying as to standard of care. Absolutely none. And during closing argument and the jury instructions that were agreed upon, the jury was told multiple times, in order to find negligence, you have to find that those trocars were placed incorrectly. That was the first step. Counsel said during closing, it's a two-step process. You need to find that they were, that they were placed improperly first, and then that it caused damage. If we look at what the jury saw in the case, there was conflicting evidence as to that placement, whether it went plumb straight down or whether it went when it was set and then went towards the actual nerve. But even the experts for the plaintiff said, I don't really disagree with the placement there. I wouldn't do it, but I need a really good reason to put them there. And the jury got that. The jury got that good reason. Dr. Grandridge said, this is where I always do it. So counsel for the plaintiff and the appellant wants us to jump right to causation, but we can't skip over the fact that the jury was instructed that you first have to find a breach of the standard of care. And as Dr. Smith said, there was testimony and the judge saw this that said, you know, there was a lot of testimony here. It was a very well done trial. There was a lot of great cross-examination. This jury may have just said, I don't think he did anything wrong. I don't even get to Dr. Albrink's testimony. I don't even get to his causation testimony. I'm sorry, because there was a lot of testimony on standard of care. So I, I understand the court's concern about the way the oral ruling was made and, and how that's confusing. But I, I really think that even the judge understood that this was just one brief moment in time. The other thing pointing to Judge Lucas's question, you know, counsel for the plaintiff could have stood up during trial and said, wait a minute, hold on, he's changing his testimony. Binger says we can't do that. Don't allow him to testify. Either he testifies as he did at, at his deposition or I get to let him go and I'm going to cross-examine him. And that's what plaintiff's counsel chose to do. Not I, I'm, I'm not, I'm having a hard time buying that, that, that impeaching an expert on inconsistent testimony is a Binger violation. I mean, you, Binger's kind of a quirky animal in terms of figuring out what kinds of things are allowed and what kinds of things aren't allowed. But, you know, if, if, the, if an expert is just taking on a whole new subject area, that can, that can be subject to Binger. But I'm, I'm not sure the fact that, that you, you know, you, you get to impeach them and up oh, there's a Binger violation. So you, you exclude them. I, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's really accurate here. Not saying exclude him totally, Your Honor. I'm saying exclude that testimony, exclude the change. Well, right, but I mean that's that's what I'm saying. Though it's just you, you got you had the deposition transcript. You got to impeach the expert in front of the jury. I'm not I'm not sure that you know I, I'm not sure it rises to the level of being stricken. Well, then, I, and and Your Honor, that then it, it, I, I'll just refer to my arguments in my brief. I, I'm not saying it was stricken. I I think what should have happened, and you said this before, the judge should have been given the opportunity. The argument should have been raised because maybe the judge could have changed something. But going back that aside, as I said in my answer brief, you know, the jury did everything they were supposed to do. The jury heard the evidence. They heard the conflicting evidence. And for now, for 
as Ms. Stein said, sending this back presumes that the jury didn't do what they were told to do. And that's just incorrect. That shouldn't happen. So even if we send this back for the, jur for the judge to kind of explain his ruling, he has to first assume that the, judge, that the jury didn't do what they were supposed to do. And, and again, I don't think there's enough in the record to make that leap. Um, with that, if there's no further questions, I will um, defer to Ms. Norris for a rebuttal. Okay. Ms. Norris, you have your full five minutes. Okay, thank you, Your Honors. Um, I wanna start with what the trial judge actually said because I, it, it, there, it didn't say anything about seven juror, didn't say anything about its opinions. It didn't say it was second guessing. It, it didn't want to second guess. It said, if this was under a Daubert standard, I believe that I would have the authority to overrule him and grant a new trial. But because he has rendered an opinion which the jury has accepted, I find that I cannot. So it's an authority finding based on Fry, based on Daubert, and nobody can say that that is correct. Um, and so again, in, in the Van case, yes, if there's an error in the re legal reasoning, you send it back for the judge to do the weighing. Um, the second thing I wanna talk about is this standard of care versus uh, causation, because the flip in Dr. Albrink's testimony, uh, the, the 180 degree that he did is on both. His flip was the ilianguinal nerve. In deposition, it was injured. At trial, it wasn't injured. And everybody agreed that if the ilianguinal nerve was injured, it was injured by a trocar, and that would be a departure from the standard of care. So this flip in testimony that the court finds incredible, that the court finds is tailored to Dr. Grandage's case, is it's precisely on both those points. And this is their only witness on those two points. Uh, the Dr. Portnier, and I, I think we touched on this, but in the, tr in the trial court, they point to this testimony during the motion hearing, and the judge says, I understand why plaintiff's counsel couldn't ask Dr. Portnier that. And if the jury was confused by that, if the jury thought, oh, it's because Dr. Portnier can't say, that only shows that they were, again, misled because Dr. Portnier wasn't legally allowed to say that, and the witness who could, the urologist, did say it. And again, that this is, again, reweighing evidence that the trial judge looked at and he said the evidence of Dr. Albrink was not credible and it was accepted by the jury. Um, I think this, this idea that, you know, he, he should have jumped up, he should have said something. If you look at how this testimony played out, there's a lot of testimony touting the, um, the, the expert's credentials, going through how he does these surgeries, and then there, there's this question very far in, do you think the ilianguinal nerve was injured? The plaintiff expects that answer to be yes. And instead he says, no, cat's out of the bag. That's why the court is allowed at the end of trial to do this look at whether or not the jury was deceived by the force and credibility evidence. And then finally, right, judge didn't need to make findings. If it didn't, if the judge thought, hey, I'm just not gonna second guess the jury, this, you know, there's no legal rationale for this. It's just, I'm looking at this evidence and I, I might see it differently. He didn't say any of that. Instead, he called him back to court and he said, I'm ruling that I cannot, I have no authority. And, and even though I'm ruling that, I want to make some special findings. And that's very unusual for me, but I want you to know this expert was not credible and the jury accepted him. And but for Fry and Daubert, I would, he, he doesn't say, he, he says, I would have authority under Daubert to do this. Well, Daubert's now the law, but we all agree the law always gave him that authority to do it if he believed the jury was deceived by the force and credibility of evidence. So we're asking this court to remand uh, for the trial judge to either reconsider or to grant the new trial uh, because his findings show that he would have done that. All right, thank you all. We'll um, go ahead and virtually um, change out the, the cases at this time. Next case that's uh, set before